The countdown is on in Europe. This is Bloomberg Markets European Close with Guy Johnson and Alex Steele. Friday the 12th, 30 minutes to the close. What do you need to know out of Europe this hour? As cases climb across much of the continent, Austria is to impose a lockdown on the unvaccinated. The Netherlands expected to announce further restrictions. Tonight in the UK, where cases have been high for months, the numbers are actually starting to decline. In fact, they're declining at the fastest rate since April. Tensions certainly rising in Eastern Europe. The US is warning that Russia may be planning an invasion of Ukraine. Moscow says the claims are, quote, empty and unfounded, but it is massing troops on the border. Some of them, apparently, the paratroopers starting to go home. The ruble's been under pressure. Stella, massive beat. Clearly one of the pandemic winners. Which stock am I talking about? Analysts there describing Richemont's latest numbers as demand for hard luxury, watches and jewellery starts to surge and really surge. Uh, let's uh, check out where we are with the markets. This is the picture right now. Stocks are bid. There you go. 486. We continue to inch ever higher. And there's the Russian ruble, as you can see, down versus the US dollar by 1.8%, Alex. But, Guy, really interesting how the rest of the markets took all of the geopolitical headlines uh, really in stride. You're looking at S&P now up by four-tenths of 1%. Materials, industrials, uh, all kind of leading the way higher within the S&P. Energy and financials, though, uh, both trading a little bit heavy. And a big part of that uh, has to do with what we're seeing in the bond market. You're seeing sell-off in the long end, uh, yields moving higher. But what's really interesting is you, this is the curve of the 20 and 30s. And it's inverting. Again, we saw this a couple weeks ago. Many analysts were like, that's not supposed to happen. That doesn't make any sense. And we're seeing it yet again, the divergence, 1.96 versus 1.94. That's kind of what we're seeing uh, within the bond market. Bloomberg Dollar Index now flipping a negative into down two-tenths of 1%. Now it's a mixed G10 dollar story. But before that, we were at the highest level since March of 20. 20. Um, and I do want, I didn't talk about commodities in the last segment, so I had to kind of do it here. And I wanted to highlight coffee because that's at a seven year high. It's not just coffee, it's things like wheat, it's things like soybeans across the board. And all that's leading to higher food prices, whether you're looking at fruits, vegetables, uh, anything that you need is going to be more expensive. Uh, you have the Fed and central banks guy might look through that, but that could have a material impact on what we feel in people's pockets. We saw that with you, Mish, and the sentiment rolling over. Yeah, the Fed can look through a whole bunch of things, but once they start looking through coffee prices going up, life is starting to get pretty serious. There are things <laughs> that you can't live without in this world, yes. and that is definitely one of them. And Prosecco. Certainly in this job. <laughs> Hopefully not at the same time. Uh -huh. uh, different kind of cocktail. Uh, OK, let's talk about what is happening here in Europe on a more serious note. Uh, the fourth wave is washing over Europe in a fairly big way. Uh, Germany, Europe's biggest economy, certainly being hit pretty hard. Austria is set to impose a lockdown on the unvaccinated. Uh, we're also expecting an announcement a little bit later on uh, in the Netherlands. Tim Lowe, Bloomberg European healthcare reporter, joining us now. Tim, can you just walk me through the dynamics that are at work here? We're starting to see stabilisation and declines in UK numbers. Are we basically seeing what we saw in the UK a couple of months ago now washing over the rest of Europe? To some extent, absolutely. The Delta was driving cases crazily high in the middle of the summer in the UK at a time where here on the continent cases were quite low. Um, it took some time for Delta to get here, and uh, here it is, and it's growing fast. Um, it's running up against the problem here in Central Europe, like Germany, for example, uh, has one of the lower vaccination rates in Europe, or in Western Europe, that is, about 67%. That's higher than it is in the U.S., but within Western Europe, it's, it's low, and um, so there's you know, a combination of the, the breakthrough infections that are hitting people that haven't vaccinated. And then you're seeing increasingly hospitals filling up in, uh, in parts of Germany that are hardest hit, where some of the lowest vaccination levels are, and the vast majority of the patients are unvaccinated. So that's hitting hard now in uh, mid-November. It's been rising the last couple of weeks, and there's a lot of consternation about what that's going to bring when uh, winter is really here. 
Yeah, Tim, and it, you know, the U.S. has been typically six weeks behind Europe, so I'm really interested to see if that's gonna, that idea is going to spread here as well. Tim, thanks a lot. Bloomberg's Tim Lowe joining us. The other top story that we're following is what's happening over in Eastern Europe. So Bloomberg's now learned the U.S. is raising the alarm with EU allies uh, that Russia may be weighing a potential invasion of Ukraine. Now, Washington says it is closely monitoring a buildup of Russian forces near its Ukrainian border. Moscow denies any aggressive intentions. Here with the latest is Greg White, who leads Bloomberg's Russia economy team. Greg, what is the latest and what are you looking for over the next 24 hours? So we're looking for signs of uh, any kind of pullback on the part of, uh, of the Russians here. Uh, they don't admit that they've uh, built up troops, but the U.S. and some outside uh, oh, satellite photo groups and other things have, have shown some evidence of uh, unusual movements. Uh, so we've seen a big push now uh, publicly by the U.S. and its allies to call on Russia to pull back. And the question now is whether there's any sign uh, that uh, Russia's going to heed that. In terms of what the objective here is, what is Putin's objective? What does he want? Why is this happening? Well, that's a big question, obviously. Putin is, uh, you know, hasn't said it publicly, but Putin has made clear you know, since the war back in 2014 over Ukraine that he's very concerned about what he sees as a uh, uh, creeping uh, expansion by uh, the U.S. and its allies into uh, Ukraine, building up uh, military capability there, even if it uh, may never actually join NATO. And uh, the, he needs, to, you know, repeatedly has made clear that that's a red line for Russia, further expansion of a U.S. military presence there. Uh, at the same time, he's seen uh, the U.S. has stepped up um, naval patrols in, in the Black Sea and uh, oh, air reconnaissance along the Russian borders, and that's an area of concern. And the Kremlin has, has warned that uh, uh, they don't they see that as a threat. Greg, looking forward to the coverage as this story unfolds. Thank you very much indeed for joining us this evening. Greg White joining us out of Moscow on what is happening in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, Alex, the headwinds just continue to mount really for Europe. Uh, it's interesting that we are seeing such a small reaction in markets. The markets have seen this play out before, mm -hmm. but nothing ultimately really comes from it that kind of the upsets the apple cart from a financial markets point of view. But nevertheless, the risks to Europe are growing. You've got COVID. We've just been talking about that. You've got the, the potential for conflict. You've got gas prices rising. I, the, the list goes on and on. We don't have the same inflationary impulse that we do uh, in the United States, certainly in the Eurozone. But nevertheless, it's interesting. Uh, Sebastian Radler keeps pointing this out. More and more challenges. Is the outlook really for European equities as good as the market seems to assume that it is? On the flip side, Sharon Bell over Goldman Sachs feels that there's 10% upside for European stocks. Um, yep. uh, Bank of America, Sebastian Radler sees 10% downside, as you mentioned, uh, because basically you're going to have strong fiscal and monetary policy impulses uh, for next year in particular. And margins are still hanging in, as you pointed out. Earnings are still coming in uh, quite strong. So it, it, yep. it, is, it does feel like something may give. But I also find the fact that we, the COVID story is un, unappreciated by the markets. And I wonder, does that mean the markets are past COVID? Well, the market seems to assume that the, the latest therapeutic breakthroughs from Pfizer, et cetera, are really going to deliver. Um, and as a result of which, yes, you are seeing case numbers go up, but actually hospitalizations are manageable at this point. It's largely hospitalizations of the unvaccinated, so that's going to encourage more people to get vaccinated in theory. But, but the, the challenges are there. I, or, I haven't even mentioned China, right. and it's slowing down. Or we've been here before. We've had this exact yep. conversation before with different waves. Um, and I said the exact same thing that I'll say now. Are, is the U.S. six weeks away from what Germany's going through? We have a, uh, a, a worse vaccination rate than, say, the ne Netherlands, but it is obviously bifurcated. But we're doing boosters here, yep. and kids are getting shots in their arms. So, I mean, uh, or are we going to be in the same kind of spot? And we're doing some regional lockdowns. Yep, Germany looks like it's going to be clearing... Um vaccines for, for five and up fairly soon even i've booked my booster but i'm old so i have the yeah, opportunity it's late to do man that whatever booster is like old news i got mine like a week ago <laughs> whatever <laughs> we're, we're gonna i don't know which one i'm gonna get which is interesting so oh, you it'll don't. be fascinating to find out no not yet so it'll be fascinating to find out which one we get. Are we into the mix and match territory? Mm, we will find out shortly. Uh, anyway, uh, we'll get Bluebay's take on this next. We'll be talking about what is coming up. Mark Downing's going to be joining us. This is Bloomberg.
Let's check in on the Bloomberg First Word News. I'm Rishka Gupta. At the Climate Summit in Glasgow, talks on creating a global carbon market have run into new obstacles. Countries disagree on how to account for emissions credits that get sold. Talks will continue today with less than 24 hours to go before the summit is set to wrap up. In Germany, the fourth coronavirus wave is hitting with full force and there's no sign of record infections easing soon. New daily cases surge past 50,000 this week for the first time. Some hospitals already are overwhelmed with patients. Officials say Germany needs to ramp up its vaccination campaign. And the labour market is tightening up in the UK. More than 22,000 job advertisements were posted in the first week of November, according to the Recruitment and Employment Confederation. That's the fourth highest since the start of 2020. Driving instructors, prison officers and forklift truck drivers were in increasing demand. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg Guy. Thank you very much indeed, Ritika. So Bank of America, as we were discussing earlier on in the programme, calling for a 10% drop on the stock 600 by early 2022. Uh, Goldman's has a different view. But the head of European strategy over at B of A, Sebastian Regler, says this, quote, we expect the anti-Goldilocks combination of weakening growth momentum and rising real bond yields to weigh on European equities. Are the bears right? Will the bulls charge ahead into 2022? That certainly has been the narrative. Mark Dowding, Blue Bay Asset Management CIO, joining us now. Mark, the headwinds for Europe are mounting. Um, you've got a situation where COVID is rising, China is slowing down. We've got an energy crisis that is underway. Brexit remains unresolved. What do you think the outlook looks like here in Europe versus the United States? Well, I think the first thing that I'd say is that the outlook in the U.S. Uh, does look stronger. It looks like uh, uh, the U.S. is a secular outperformer. Uh, and uh, although we're seeing uh, uh, things like the Michigan survey dipping today uh, and there's some response to um, uh, higher prices, I, I think the, the narrative is one where uh, there's uh, plenty of demand uh, and uh, uh, with consumers uh, facing very strong balance sheet, uh, I, I continue to think that the U.S. economy can uh, continue to uh, remain very healthy uh, as we enter into 2022. In Europe, um, the outlook is, is not as strong, uh, but um, uh, ultimately, uh, we're, we're not as worried as uh, maybe some of your commentators may be in terms of uh, another wave uh, with respect to COVID. Uh, I think we've already had the experience here in the UK of uh, elevated numbers of infections over the course of the past six weeks or so, and it doesn't really seem to be doing much to um, uh, weigh on the economy uh, to this particular point. If anything, uh, it may be giving a bit of a fillip to uh, uh, those who have not get, uh, been uh, vaccinated uh, to go and get their jab. So, so when we look at things from a European perspective, we, we continue to see uh, some ongoing recovery um, in, in the, in, in the um, sort of a growth trajectory. Uh, and um, albeit we think that the ECB is going to be more accommodative um, and, and certainly slower in terms of uh, moving to uh, uh, rain back policy stimulation than the, the Federal Reserve is going to be. So with that in mind, would you be on the other side of that trade? So you have Bank of America sees 10% downside. I said Goldman Sachs sees 10% upside, in part because of the dual fiscal monetary impulse uh, that will definitely be coming next year, stronger earnings and margins, et cetera. Does that sound right to you, or is there another kind of thesis? So I, I think the, uh, the the big story for us is going to be um, uh, the inflation story uh, and uh, what we're going to see prospectively in terms of a policy response in light of that. There, there are kind of two scenarios uh, that the markets are facing right now. Uh, if inflation ends up as uh, relatively benign and comes back to earth of its own accord, uh, then um, the, the uh, sort of profile in terms of policy is going to be pretty benign. Uh, and against that sort of backdrop, um, you, you can still see um, uh, an outcome, I'd suggest, where uh, risk assets can continue to perform really pretty well in 2022. Um, but the flip side to that is the, the narrative that uh, inflation uh, goes up, stays up, uh, and, uh, and becomes more troubling for policymakers as we move through the course of the months ahead. Uh, and, and, and this is actually the camp that I'd find myself leaning towards. Uh, we, we've been looking for above um, consensus inflation all year, uh, notably in the U.S. Um, uh, but uh, obviously it's the, the U.S. market will, which will tend to drive global markets. What about Europe? What do you think the inflationary outlook is going to look like? People are trying to figure out 
I, equities seem to be the, the, the destination of choice at the moment. But I'm wondering what happens in the credit markets if we are going to see inflation, even in Europe, starting to push higher. Now, as you say, the ECB is likely to remain fairly accommodative. We don't know exactly what it's going to be doing in terms of the next round uh, of purchases, but it'll be interesting to see what they do on the credit front there. How supported do you think European credit is going to be in this environment? So I think it is going to remain supported. I, I think that the ECB is uh, in December going to announce uh, an addition to the uh, asset purchase program to offset the fact that the PEP is going to come to an end in March. So I don't think you're going to see an abrupt end to, to asset purchases in the context of the Eurozone. And although inflation is going up, um, the, the, the delta on inflation is uh, materially lower than we would be looking for in the US or, or the UK for that matter. I mean, I think that when we look at the, uh, the US, we're, we're looking at core CPI early in the new year going well above six. Um, the headline on CPI could be well above seven, even testing towards eight if uh, oil prices uh, are strong into the end of the year. So we're, we're seeing uh, very pronounced uh, inflation prints, we think, in the US. We don't think the UK will be far behind that. Whereas in Europe, although inflation is moving up, mm -hmm. uh, we, we, um, we, we do think the fact that there has been a, a bigger output gap in Europe will probably contain inflationary pressures to a greater degree. So you're probably only looking at inflation on a forehandle in the Eurozone. Mark, what's the contagion risk from China? So for, from a Chinese perspective, uh, obviously, if we see a, a mark slowing in China, that's, uh, that, that's going to be bad news in the context of uh, uh, of sort of uh, demand for, for European exports. Uh, but I would say that the, the big narrative that we see in China is, um, uh, as well as the slowing, it's more of a growth reorientation. Uh, we actually, you, you see this in the, uh, the trade numbers that we saw earlier in the week, very strong Chinese export numbers. So China is the factory of the world and, uh, and that factory is uh, uh, facing very strong demand. So we, we actually see a pretty healthy outlook in terms of Chinese uh, manufacturing production. We see uh, similarly, a pretty strong outlook in terms of Chinese consumption. Mm -hmm. uh, the one very notable, notable part of the economy that's going to be slowing very profoundly uh, in China is, is going to be the, the property and construction sector. So that's bad news if you're Brazil and you're exporting iron ore. Uh, and it's been interesting to look at iron ore prices being so weak relative to other commodities, perhaps. Uh, and so it's really a question of uh, what are you exporting to China if you're exporting um, uh, goods which are, are used in, in, the, in the context of uh, uh, new buildings and construction, yeah. uh, clearly it's not good news for you. But if, you, if you're producing sort of high-end consumer um, uh, exports, like the Italians do, for example, uh, it's not clear it's necessarily going to be uh, such bad news. Mark, really great analysis. We love talking to you. Happy Friday. Thank you for joining us. Mark Dowding, Blue Bay Asset Management CIO. Uh, all right, coming up, demand for luxury goods is back. You just heard that link between Italy and China when it comes to luxury goods. Now we'll talk about Richemont, the owner of Cartier Mont Blanc, uh, posting stellar, quoting from analysts, stellar earnings results. More on that next. This is Bloomberg. It's time for the Bloomberg Business Flash, a look at some of the biggest business stories in the news right now. I'm Rishka Gupta. Environmentalists confronted one of Europe's top aviation executives at the climate summit today. EasyJet CEO Johan Lundgren argued that limiting flying through bans, high affairs and taxation would deny people in less developed countries the chance to travel. But activists said that was a better way of slashing carbon emissions than what airlines have proposed, using synthetic fuels and hydrogen-powered planes. Riviana Automotive has an extensive post-IPO to-do list. The electric vehicle company raised $12 billion earlier this week. Now it wants to build a standalone battery plant in addition to two new vehicle assembly factories that already were planned. Bloomberg's learned that Arizona, Michigan and Texas are amongst the states being considered for the battery site. And that is your latest business flash, Guy. Really good. Thank you very much indeed. Luxury goods manufacturer Richemont. It owns Cartier, it owns Mont Blanc, amongst another uh, range of black, uh, brands. Um, releasing earnings earlier on that certainly beats analysts' expectations. Richemont is also in talks with Farfetch to sell a stake in Netta Porter. Ukes, uh, let's talk a little bit more about this with Andrea Felstead of Bloomberg Opinion. I read through the analyst note this morning, notes this morning. Stellar. Massive beat. 
clearly one of the uh, the post pandemic winners the, the the analyst community was absolutely blown away by these numbers why um Basically, luxury has bounced back. Despite the worries about China, luxury is still doing well. And jewellery and watches have actually performed pretty well. Many pretty people... well? These are amazing numbers. <laughs> exactly. Many people have accumulated savings during the pandemic. If you're a man, what do you do? You treat yourself to a watch. If you're a lady, it tends to be a handbag or a nice piece of jewellery. So, Richemont's in two of those three. I actually know someone who treated themselves to eight high-end watches during the pandemic. <laughs> I don't understand, but that's what happened. Um, so, uh, Andrea, I'm also interested in not only can that continue, but what Richmond stands to gain from sort of letting go of its stake in net a porte and ukes, et cetera, and sort of what the problem was there and what that means for Richemont. Um, ukes net a porte, um, it helped Richmond into the digital space. But unfortunately, it was, it was heavily loss-making. So uh, this deal should help take away uh, the losses, or at least all of them, um, and help the company's valuation. But there's, there's also another side to this. In a way, getting rid of a part of Hughes uh, Netoporte is the easy bit. It, it's what happens after that that is, uh, is trickier. Yeah, so it's got to figure out what it wants to be and where it goes next. Um, and as you say, it, it, it was a helping hand into the digital world. Now, the digital world has transformed this sector in a really big way. It allowed them particularly to reach a younger demographic over in China. Talk to me about what is happening in China right now. What does demand look like? This is the kind of high-end, conspicuous stuff that maybe the Chinese government is pushing back on. Exactly. You've got two things going on in China at the moment. You've got the immediate sort of wobbles, which have come from the increase in COVID cases and the restrictions that were put in place. They've had an impact on Burberry. We're talking about that yesterday. Yep. What we don't know, what is the big unknown, is what the common prosperity policy will do. And while it might encourage more first time luxury buyers, it could put a dampener on those very big spenders that would be the buyers for these, uh, these jewellery brands and some of the high end watches. Maybe make availability over here look a little bit more manageable. <laughs> Andrea, thank you very much indeed. Andrea Felstead of Bloomberg Opinion. Sorry, Alex, eight watches. Watches. I, I guess you could argue this is just asset allocation, re-asset allocation. Uh, if these things, the value holds up, maybe it's worth it. It, it was eight. He didn't tell his wife. It got confusing. No, that's the critical thing. It got a little dicey. Uh, but, you know, I, I guess it does raise the question, like, was that the peak kind of thing? Like, is this the best it's going to get? Yeah, if you can't go out and you're spending a lot of time online deciding what exactly you want to spend your money on, maybe watches are the way to go. AstraZeneca, certainly one of the companies that has been front and centre during the COVID vaccine story. We'll talk about it next. The numbers were out a little bit earlier on. Emily Field is going to be joining us from Barclays. So we're wrapping up the Friday session here in Europe. The last trading session of the week. Has it been a positive week? Has it been a negative week? Uh, it looks like the US is probably heading for its first negative week in six. Here in Europe, it's a slightly different picture. And I think also currency adjusting is a really important aspect to what you need to do uh, with your view of what is happening here. Uh, because you take a look at a lot of the numbers in euros, they look great. Take a look at them in dollars, not so much. Anyway, this is the action today. FTSE 100 down by half of 1%. One stock doing the damage. It's AstraZeneca. We'll talk more about it in just a moment. Uh, the CAC Quarante is up by half of 1%. But actually, the real action for the CAC Quarante is actually over in Switzerland. We've just been talking about Richemont, the effects into the the luxury sector uh, across the Swiss border into France, really quite dramatic today. The luxury sector getting a boost uh, from the Richemont numbers. Uh, Germany fairly flat today, only up by one-tenth of one percent. But in aggregate, we continue to climb. Let's take a look at the stock 600 on the week. Remember, this is calculated uh, largely in euros. So uh, we get the, uh, the local currency effect coming through here. Um, 486. So we started kind of, where do we start? Kind of around 482 or 483. We've added uh, around three points to this this week. We're up by around six, seven tenths of 1%. As I say, currency adjusted, you get a less dramatic effect out of the pounds, out of the euros, uh, into dollars. Uh, but nevertheless, the climb over the last few days has been dramatic. 
And you have to think about this from the context of where we started, which was already record highs. The earnings season has actually delivered for Europe. Let's take a quick look at what the, uh, the GRR looks like to give you a kind of sector breakdown story and an idea of what is happening here today. There's the luxury sector right up there at the top. That's the Richemont effect. It's bled down into the retail sector, which is up by 1.27%. On the week, it's actually been the miners that have delivered the biggest upside on the week. Today, though, energy in the commodity space is the biggest loser, down by nine-tenths of 1%. Travel and leisure down again. It has had a very tough week, as we've seen the number of cases in Europe continuing to climb. So let's talk about the individual names. Richemont, we mentioned it, the effect absolutely massive for the Swiss market and for the French market today. Richemont up by 10 points, let's call it 11%. Red Row, the UK housing market was expected to slow. It hasn't. The house builders continue to benefit. Red Row, one of those today, again, upgrading guidance in terms of what it expects to see coming forward in terms of the housing market here in the UK. The stock up by nearly 2%, but the real drag here in London today, Alex, has been AstraZeneca. Uh, it is starting to move towards taking profits when it comes to the, to the COVID shots, but that's not really where the damage has been done here. There's some integration issues that we need to figure out and talk about. Uh, are they just front-loading some of those issues in terms of the acquisitions they've made? That seems to be a drag at the moment. Then some of the therapeutics that they're talking about uh, are not quite coming up to snuff in terms of expectations. So AstraZeneca mm -hmm. today down by 7%. Huge, huge drag on the FTSE 100. Yeah, it was a big miss for that cancer drug, Tariqa uh, Tegriso, which is what uh, a lot of analysts really highlighted here. Let's get more on that. Um, Emily Field, Barclays, head of European Pharmaceuticals Equity Research, joins us now. Emily has an overweight rating on the stock with a 110 price target. Uh, your take on earnings, you're sticking with the price target. Yeah, um, you know, stepping back, it does look like, at least with Tegriso, as you pointed out, there was a significant revenue shortfall, shortfall here. It does seem that that is driven by temporary inventory effects in China. The company was quite adamant on the call this afternoon that the growth story there remains intact. What investors were really struggling with, as you mentioned previously, is, is the integration issues. There were going to be a lot of moving parts going into this quarter. Telegraphing the impact of the vaccine on margin, in spite of them taking no profits, has proven to be somewhat difficult. This is the first full quarter with them, including Alexion, on a consolidated basis. And so telegraphing how that was going to impact operating margin proved to be very difficult for us. We were over 27 percent, as was the street. They came in at 23.1. The company did maintain full-year guidance, but what people really wanted was some insights into 2022, and we didn't necessarily get that from the company on the call this afternoon. OK, let's pull that all together. The Alexion integration <laughs> and the, the guidance that they've stuck to. What does that imply about what is happening with Alexion? Are they just front-loading some of the costs or is there a larger integration issue which they can't figure out? Yeah, it, it doesn't seem like that's the case, that there's any sort of nefarious issue at play here. I think um, Alexia and revenues were pretty much in line. And um, I think what has proven to be quite difficult is legacy Astra revenues or uh, operating margins have been difficult to predict kind of all throughout this year because of the impact of the COVID vaccine. Transitioning to profitability, they also are have some front-loaded costs from their long-acting antibody for COVID, which they have filed with regulatory authorities but is not yet approved. So there's just a lot of different pieces here across legacy AstraZeneca, COVID, and Alexian that have just made modeling somewhat difficult. Um Emily, do you feel like there's room um, for Astra? A guy had mentioned it, that they're going to actually make a profit with their vaccine. Is there a way to improve the vaccine, go into more therapeutics when it comes to COVID to sort of move that part of their business line forward? Yeah, well, the company is, is trialing a booster vaccine. And, and the call today, they were quite positive on their long-acting antibody, which actually did, has shown that it... Um, has a one-year benefit in immunocompromised people in terms of preventing COVID infection who may not respond to the vaccine. So it does look like that could still be a product that could actually be a very significant contributor in, in just helping response to the pandemic. Although, you know, kind of taking a step back, one thing that I guess is kind of good for everybody is the company said they weren't going to profit from the vaccine until we were through the pandemic. So oh. I guess by moving to a for-profit basis, that says something good. Emily, um... Just looking around the sector at the moment, there's a lot of action elsewhere. We, we have the J&J &J news today. GSK is, is looking effectively to break up as well. A lot of the other businesses in the space are looking to refocus and figure out a smarter, smoother operating structure. 
Does that mean that, that effectively Astra has more competition in terms of where we want to be allocating money within the space? It has been a real turnaround story. It's got its pipeline sorted. Pascal Sorio has completely revolutionized this business. But others are now starting to make similar moves, doing different things, just trying to make their businesses more attractive. Does that make Astra less attractive? At this point, I wouldn't say so. I still think that, um, you know, when you have a day like today, you want to step back and say, is there anything broken here? Is the growth thesis that makes us positive on the name in any way impaired? And I would say no. Um, the Tregrisso issues seem temporary, and here too had some amazing data in breast cancer at, the, uh, at a conference in September of this year. They have the best-in-class oncology portfolio of the companies we cover. So I think that that story remains intact. However, you know, investors do like pharma companies to streamline. It's something that the whole space has been doing over the past 10 to 15 years. And we actually did upgrade GSK to equal weight from underweight last Friday, just as we're kind of now getting to that point where it feels like playing the spin is a little more tangible, as that spin is on track for mid-2022 with a consumer health update in early 2022 scheduled. Emily, along those, along those lines, how long are we going to have to take to know if that's the right way to go? Like, shareholders might want it, and industry is slowly starting to sort of disintegrate the conglomerate model. But the idea is that you have different parts of your business offsetting other parts of your business that you might need heavy R&D or when that business is slowing growth. Um, how long until we know if this is going to work? Yeah, I mean, I think in the case of GSK, um, you know, what the company has concluded is that there just aren't a whole lot of synergies from having a consumer health business with a prescription pharmaceutical business. You know, different, uh, uh, different uh, selling channels, different ways of getting the products approved. It, um, and many other companies in the consumer space over the years and potentially going forward have come to similar conclusions. Um, you know, in the case of GSK specifically, whether that proves to be the right decision will likely come after the spin when we get a, a chance to see, you know, are there investments that they've made in their pharmaceutical pipeline paying off? Hmm. A broader question from me, Emily. Is the healthcare sector the right place to head to if you are worried about inflation? Yeah, I, um, you know, we've actually seen a little bit more interest in the space from generalists who have really stayed away from the space over the course of this year with the looming specter of potential drug pricing reform in the United States. Um, it does appear that the uh, current proposal that could be added to the Build Back Better plan is in one of those buckets of scenarios that would not be all that impactful uh, to the sector um, as it kind of stands today. So I think taking that into effect and also, you know, the demand for the products is, you know, relatively inelastic. So if you're thinking about that in an inflationary world, I think that putting all that together sets up the pharma space well for 2022. Emily, great stuff. Always interesting to get your analysis on what is happening here. The broader picture, fascinating too. Emily Field, Barclays Head of European Pharmaceuticals Equity Research. Greatly appreciated. Um, we're done here in Europe. A negative day. Europe certainly hit by some of the stocks that we've been talking about or affected by some of the stocks that we've been talking about over the last few minutes. Richemar really giving the, the luxury sector a massive boost. That's helped the cat care on out today. These are the final numbers. Uh, and the FTSE 100 being hit pretty hard by Astra. It's the largest cap stock. You get a day like today where Astra is under significant pressure, Alex. Boom. Down we go. Yep. Underperformance uh, of the FTSE 100. Yeah, also, Guy, we're talking about the last day of COP26. Um, and there's lots of questions as to, did it work? Did anything come of it? Um, currently, you got delegates over in Scotland are, you know, tussling over the temperature, uh, carbon tax. That's kind of all in the cards as well. We're going to talk more about this right after the break. Dan Jorensen is Denmark Minister of Clim Climate and Energy and Utilities. He joins, he joins us next uh, from Glasgow. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets, the European close. I'm Ritika Gupta, and you're looking at a live shot of the principal room. Coming up, Liz Schuler, the AFL-CIO president. That's at 12.30 p.m. in New York. This is Bloomberg. Let's check in on the Bloomberg First World News. I'm Ritika Gupta. Warning from the U.S. on Russia. Bloomberg's learned that Washington has told the European Union 
that Russia may be considering an invasion of Ukraine. The U.S. has been monitoring a buildup of Russian forces on the Ukrainian border. All this is occurring as tensions flare between Russia and the EU over energy supplies and migrants. Russia says talks of an invasion is unfounded. In the UK, Conservative members of Parliament are urging Prime Minister Boris Johnson to crack down on money laundering. 17 lawmakers wrote to Johnson this week asking him to tackle economic crime in the current House of Commons session. The National Crime Agency estimates that money laundering costs the UK more than $130 billion a year. And AstraZeneca now wants to profit from the coronavirus vaccine it developed with the University of Oxford. The British drug maker watched as Pfizer and Moderna reaped huge returns from their own shots. AstraZeneca says it will start generating profits with new orders, but the vaccine will still be sold at cost to developing nations. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Riska Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Alex Guy. Well, COP26 now winding down in Glasgow with talks set to stretch into the weekend. Joining us now for more is Dan Jurensen, Denmark Minister of Climate, Energy and Utilities. Denmark's government described their climate action strategy as a hockey stick model. Kind of wait for the technology to develop uh, before adaptation. When do we get the final communique? Minister? Was that a question for me? When do we get the final communique? Yes, I, I'm sure. I, I... Good. Okay, so now the negotiations are going into the final stage, and uh, it's too early to say when they will uh, finish. Uh, right now, the presidency, the British presidency, is saying that uh, it will be this evening, uh, but they might very well go on all night. The biggest hurdles right now is can we keep the 1.5 temperature increase uh, alive? Meaning, is it possible for us to agree on the necessity to make reductions in CO2 emissions so that that is actually feasible? Minister, good afternoon. It's Guy in London. Um, do you think that this summit has been successful? It's too early to say. In, in, on the other, one hand, uh, it is a success. I think that uh, so far there has been some real progress on the action track. So a big agreement on uh, the stop of deforestation, a big agreement on phase out of coal, uh, on methane and those things. But with regards to the actual negotiation of the United Nations text, uh, we don't know yet where that will end. But the, the draft text that's out there now is definitely in many ways looking positive. Do we get anything on carbon price and trading? This is not a text that will introduce a global carbon uh, taxation system, but it will create, if it is adopted uh, the way it looks now, uh, I believe a, a strong incentive for countries individually to introduce such systems because uh, this will be, I think, an important step in the direction of a market economy, a global market economy, where countries that are energy efficient, countries that use sustainable energy, that cut their emissions, uh, are also the most competitive. In terms of kind of what happens next, as you say, we probably won't get a carbon price. There is a debate about the future of coal. And we're trying to understand exactly what role is going to, what role coal is going to play. Clearly, it is an important part of the energy mix in Eastern Europe. The United States still relies on coal. China, in particular, still relies on coal, as does India, as does South Africa. What do you think, post this summit, the future of coal looks like? Well, we need to get rid of coal. There's no doubt about that. I mean, if we are to keep the temperature increases below 1.5 degrees, which we all uh, agree that, that, we, that we do, then all fossils need to go, and, and coal is the first one. I, I do acknowledge, as I'm sure uh, most uh, decision makers do, that uh, that is a big challenge for many countries. But on the other hand, we now have very cheap alternatives. I'm from a country that has a lot of offshore wind, for instance. Now, when we build offshore wind farms, they actually produce energy that's cheaper than the energy from a coal power plant.
I'd like to broaden out, Minister, and talk about the energy crisis in Europe right now. Um, the U.S. has warned Europe that Russia could be planning a Ukraine invasion. Belarus yesterday threatened uh, the EU gas market that they would stop uh, transporting 20 percent then of European natural gas. What is the risk of an energy crisis right now? Well, I think the current energy crisis and especially the, the very uh, high increases in prices of energy consumers in, 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 for energy consumers in Europe just goes to show that the present system is not a good system and that we really need in Europe to be independent of uh, energy uh, sources from other countries. So the right way for Europe is to uh, create more alternative energy, more renewable energy. Uh, in that way, they will not only help solve the climate crisis, but also help solve a problem for themselves, which we see right now, which is that you are actually very dependent on other countries, among them Russia. So what, what should Europe do with Russia? What should Europe do with Nord Stream 2, Minister? It goes through Danish waters. Clearly, Vladimir Putin would like to see that given an accelerated certification. What is your position on that? Well, I do think that the agreement that has been made by Germany and the, and the U.S. as a pragmatic one, I do think that it's important to, to acknowledge that the green energy transition, which all of Europe uh, needs to go through, first of all, it does need to speed up. But second of all, it's different from country to country how it's done. A country like Poland, for instance, gets around 80% uh, of their electricity right now from coal. And they need to bring that down to maybe around 10, 11% already in 2040 is their plan. So the rest of Europe needs to help them in that transition. And that is also taking place right now. The European Union has put forward a Green uh, New Deal, which not only proposes a, a reduction target of 55%, which is a very high target uh, for, for Europe, but also uh, different sources of, uh, of resources to pay for this and regulation to make it possible. Minister, one final quick question from me. Um, we are seeing a significant spike in COVID cases around Europe right now um, across many different countries. What are you planning in Denmark for? You must be involved in this conversation. We're trying to figure out what the energy requirements are going to be. Do you think there is the possibility that we're going to see further lockdowns, more restrictions that ultimately could place a dampening in effect on the energy demand that Europe is going to need this winter? Yes, no doubt that the COVID pandemic influences the energy market in several ways. One way is that the demand of, of energy actually falls. Uh, but another one is that the energy security in some countries can be threatened because when you close down a society, there's a danger that that also affects uh, the utilities, electricity, heating, all of those uh, things. And I think we as a global community have an obligation to each other to make sure that the countries that face those problems can get help. Minister, it's been a great pleasure speaking with you this afternoon. Thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. Dan Jorgensen, Denmark Minister of Climate, Energy and Utilities. Thank you very much indeed. This is Bloomberg. a little higher in the United States. What's moving? Let's find out. Here's Abigail Doolittle. Well, Guy, we have really outsized moves for a second day in a row here for some of these storage uh, stocks. Take a look at Seagate, Western Digital, both of these stocks up more than 10% over the last two days. The interesting thing about it is there's no clear reason why, at least to me, but call volume is strong, suggesting buyers are in. As for the worst two stocks, HPE was downgraded over at Goldman Sachs to a sell on a weak IT spending. And then, of course, we found out that Elon Musk has sold more stock, I think bringing that total to $5.9 billion. And then finally, 
finally, Alex, take a look at Rivian. Here it is, just keeping climbing up over the last three days since IPOing. Very, very strong, up 66% not so shabby at all for the EV truck maker. Yeah, super strong uh, IPO there. Abigail, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. All right, well, coming up, we have a big week ahead. The Dubai Air Show on Monday. That's kind of like, guys, Super Bowl. Prime Minister Boris Johnson also speaking. Tuesday, we get U.S. Uh, retail sales. I'm quite looking forward to that, particularly how it sets us up in terms of inventory guy uh, for the holidays. Yeah, I'll be watching the Super Bowl from afar this time round. It's the first time we've had an air show in person. Wednesday, UK and European CPI, what does the inflation picture look like? How big a gap are there, is there going to be between those two numbers? Massive, massive week for retail next week. We get Target, we get Lowe's earnings. Uh, Thursday, we've got a lot of Fed speakers as well. We want to pay attention to that. Actually, get some UK retail data on Friday as well. Mm. So a big week coming up on the retail front. Your kind of week, Alex. Yeah, oh, totally, my kind of week. That wraps it up for me and Guy on TV. Coming up, Jason Furman, former Council of Economic Advisors chairman, joins Balance of Power with David Weston on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Bloomberg.